Alright, so let's talk about even more amazing secrets and expert tips to make the most out of Palworld, from optimizing the heck out of your team, bases, or even make it easier to farm the most annoying of the endgame resources. Now, as is tradition, we're gonna start things off by mastering the ultimate traversal trick, which is the grappling hook animation cancel. Essentially, what you have to do is to pull a line, let your character get dragged almost until the end, and right as you're about to hit the maximum velocity, you're going to want to immediately cancel that grapple hook by doing a quick dodge, and then immediately jump straight into a glider. So let me show you what I mean by that. We're gonna use this hill right here. I'm gonna go ahead and use the grappling hook right there at that spot, immediately do a dodge almost at the end before the character lands, and then just jump straight into that glider. It can be a parachute, it can be one of your gliding pals, obviously in the case of the pals it's going to be much much better. You're going to then want to combine this with the next trick, which is this constant cancel and reactivation of the glide mode. This essentially achieves a few very good benefits, one is that it just keeps you in the air for a lot longer essentially by not consuming as much stamina as you normally would if you were just to glide away. And second of all, depending on the pal that you use, like for example Gale Claw, you can even gain a speed boost and even a slight lift up whenever you reactivate that pal again. So much so that you can reach much further away and do it much faster compared to doing gliding the normal way, which doesn't seem to even reach 70% of the same distance. By the way, you can pull this off very easily by just jumping again or pressing the jump button while gliding or even the crouch and then jumping again to reactivate it. Now moving on to number 3, a lot of you actually suggested me to do this, but yeah, maybe swap from Gale Claw to Hang You as you might get a lot more benefits. So Hang You is one of the few and maybe if not even the only glider NPC that can actually lift you up instead of letting you descend. So you can actually use this early on to go over, for example, structures or just lift yourself up over mountains when otherwise you might not have access to a mount just yet. But we can combine this with the previous two tricks and also gain a ton of speed on him as by default he's actually very slow. So doing the same trick yet again with the grappling hook, if you do it right towards the end of the line, you're going to keep that momentum and then be able to use hang you to further just like glide away. But in this case, I would even call it flying as technically you're ascending, not really descending. And the best part about this is that compared to Gale Claw, for example, we were able to go more than double that distance and maybe then some like super easily even reaching right here at the first tower boss right from the start of the map so that's actually quite a lot of distance covered but of course you can also use these tricks over in dungeons to just traverse these tunnels much faster obviously they will make things a breeze to reach the final boss room or even complete them much easier now at number four fellas let's be honest it costs a lot of souls to upgrade our favorite pals and we're gonna have to consume a ton of them to get like a full team going however there is one amazing spot in the end game but even before that that you can actually use to gain a ton of souls very fast especially the medium and the large ones and that area is going to be right here up in the desert up in its northern section right here very close to this waypoint of the deep sand dunes and it's a perfect location because this spawns exclusively the orange and the purple chest so pretty much the medium and the large pal souls and you will get anywhere between one to three per each individual chest on average sometimes they don't drop it at all but uh, yeah most of the time they do Plus, they also seem to drop a lot of spheres, especially Jega and Hyper Spheres. So around that middle, towards end game part of the game, you can definitely benefit from this farm. Now, best thing about this is that you can also see the chest spawning pretty much the first from the distance. They are some of the first things that actually load as you go fast on the map. Plus, they also respawn rather quickly, so by the time you're back to the waypoint, you can then do another farming route and get another batch. Now at number 4 I have two tips to make transportation of mats between bases a lot more easier and straightforward. And in this case, let's say you want a specific number of each resource to build a specific item onto your other base. That's also in part because maybe it takes a bit too much time to constantly divide these stacks as they become much bigger and they weigh too much and you don't want to stay there and do any calculations. What I recommend doing is to go ahead and take a look at whichever item you want to build in that other base. In this case, maybe an electric furnace or an assembly line. 
And what you want to do is to just go ahead and place it down without building it. So just to show you, in this case, I don't have anything in my inventory. What I'm going to do is pick that electric furnace. This is something that I want to build, place it down. And before it gets finished, I'm going to go ahead and scrap it. And what this does is that it immediately gives me exactly those precise number of resources that I need to craft one of these. I could repeat the process and get twice this amount, but essentially I'm just going to go ahead to my other base with this exact number of resources and build that thing right there. And at no point I risk being overweight, having to fat roll or well fat crawl and just do everything efficiently and extremely fast. The next trick is likely going to get fixed soon, but will let you pretty much transport any weight without ever having to place it in your inventory. So let me show you what you need to do. Let's say you have two different containers in your base. One of them has maybe 10,000 stone that you really want to transport to the other container. So what you can do in this case is to go ahead, click on that specific mat, and then just hold it with your mouse without transferring it to your normal character inventory. From this point on, while holding it, go ahead and press tab on your keyboard and then simply move to your next destination or container, whichever it is. And as you can see, you can easily just lift that in the air without ever having to lift a muscle. Once you're at that other chest, open it, place it inside and congrats, you just transported like 30,000 tons without having to lift a muscle. You can rinse then repeat this with any other type of mat. It works with literally anything right now. Plus, in case it happens for you to misclick and lose that stack while holding it, you will always find it back at its original location. Next, do yourselves a favor and immediately start cooking salads for your workforce as soon as they become available. You can unlock the tomato and the lettuce plantations at level 32 and 38 respectively. And once you do, you can literally craft the best food for your workforce in the game, which is obviously the salad. This gives them a ton of hunger meter fill. It also improves their sanity a lot faster. Plus, best of all, it even improves their work speed for a pretty decent amount of time. You can, of course, buy the seeds from the red merchant right here at the dune shelter, but other NPCs should also sell all of these seeds for the tomatoes and the lettuce. And once you place this down, you can go ahead and craft this and feed your pals and you're going to immediately notice an improvement to their productivity. So for example, in the case of my Ormontide Ignis, which was crafting cakes, by default, it required about 24 to 25 seconds to do so. But with the lattice buff active, it only needed 18. Obviously, this is going to be even better for stuff that takes shorter time to craft in case you're going to want to craft things very fast and very easy. Number 7, not really much of a tip as much of a heads up. Following update 1.4, you can now finally equip two shirts at the same time on your character, including two of the same type. So for example, let's say you already have a cold resistance armor, you can just place down two of these heat resistant undershirts, gain a rank 2 into heat resistance, and this is going to pretty much cover every single area of the game. Even the volcano area and the Mount Obsidian up in the west, so you can now pretty much not have to care about any of that at all. By the way, you can easily buy these from the Dune Shelter NPCs or the ones that you captured back at your base as they seem to sell both of them and you can also reset them. However, I've also seen quite a number of these shirts dropping from dungeons too. At number 8, did you know you can apply multiple status effects on the same target to gain multiple bonuses to capture rate? So in this case, anywhere between 5-10% to for each status application. So if you set an enemy on fire, poison them and then electrocute them, you will gain 3 distinct buffs to your capture rate for each and every single one of them. So let me give you an example, my default capture rate for this memo rest is 7% with a legendary sphere, however if I shoot some of these starting poisoned arrows, which are also low level by the way, it immediately poisons them and now my capture rate is going to be 11%. If you then throw maybe a fire pal in the mix, which also reduces its HP quite a bit, but um, it also sets it on fire, you can see that from 16% capture rate, we immediately jump to 24 once the Memorest is set on fire. Now, around this time is also when the poison fades, so you should normally attack him with the poison arrows, but just to show you the difference, from 24, it drops back to 18, 19, so that's a 7, 6% difference right there. 
Now, this difference becomes bigger and bigger as the HP goes lower and lower on the enemy. So, as you can see, we have a 51% capture rate with two applications of a status effect. This could have been an easy 61% if I also had some shock damage, but it's 51. And if I let one of the statuses to go down, it now drops 11% down to 40 so that's actually very very low it of course gets reapplied by my pal but you can see pretty much that these status effects can heavily improve your capture rate now in the context that the effigies kind of ruin it plus the fact that it seems to be kind of low anyway for some of these high level pals now at some point around the middle of the game to the end game you're going to need quite a bit of high quality cloth and this is something that you're going to use to craft some of these large pal beds and some of the best actually in the game but that is going to require quite a bit of that cloth slash wool so the best way to do so is not to use lamb balls you will want to immediately transition even in the early stages to either kremis or even to some of these melpacas, both of which are actually going to yield twice as many wool drops as a normal lamb ball does. And the fact about especially Kremis is that they don't take long to be captured after you already start the game. By level 10, you're going to find a ton of them nearby that cursed slash collapsed church. But of course, alpacas are just as good. Both of these work exactly the same. And as you can see, they will give you a ton of this wool to immediately drop into some crafting. Moving on to number 10, did you know that you can improve the work suitability on literally any pal in the game? And some of them can actually exceed the limit of the ones you can capture in the world wild and reach a level 5 in some of the best work suitability. So this is something that you achieve by essentially 4 starring one of these spells. Whenever you 4 star them, all of their work suitability gets a plus 1 in efficiency. So if your pal, for example, had a rank 4 into something, obviously his new level is going to be 5. But it also goes for the low level ones. If they had 1, 2 or 3, the next one is going to be plus 1 for all suitability that they have available. So let me give you an example with the Jormuntide Ignis. In this case, I have one with 4 stars, which has a level 5 in Kindling and compare that to a rank 4 in Kindling. So yeah, the difference here is absolutely insane. As you can see, the rank 5 absolutely runs laps around the rank 4, which is not even a competition. By the time this one bakes one cake, the other bakes pretty much like 5. So that's going to be an even bigger difference than it was to rank up from Kindling level 3 to Kindling level 4. But of course, this will go similarly to all the others. So if you want better mining, better transportation, better just work benching, you're going to be able to get these. But let me tell you, it will be extremely costly. However, end game wise, this will be an absolute game changer. Speaking of secret pal stats, IV stats are also a thing in pal world and in fact they can make a huge difference when it comes to the attack power, defenses, HP and pretty much all the major stats each individual specimen has. You likely already noticed that members of the same species at the exact same levels might have had different amounts of HP and damage even though they were very similar in all other regards. That is because of these internal IV stat calculations that are going to fall in a range for every single individual. So there has been some data mined, however I'm going to keep it short and tell you how it is. Essentially for the HP that range can fall anywhere between 0 to 50%, meanwhile for the attack and defenses it's anywhere between 0 to 30%. So let's say you have two pals which at first glance appear to be complete carbon copies of each other. However, if you look closer, you might notice that one of them has an HP value which might be up to 50% higher than the other. Or maybe a tech power that can be up to 30% higher than the other. This is something that you can actually calculate or use tools online to see for yourself. I highly recommend Palpedia or of course uh, the spreadsheet created by the actual data miner which in my opinion is much better but you can use either of these two you will find the links down below and calculate how good you are on that IV stat on your current pal because these IV stats are going to transfer to the offsprings and you want to transfer very high and good IV stats to your offsprings. So let me give an example with this level. 14 in this case relax Zorist. I recommend having as close as possible to level 50 
for the best results but you can even calculate this on a low level so i'm going to go ahead and input all of these values right here essentially the hp value the attack uh, and also pay absolute attention to the passive skills also put these in exactly how they are so that it spits out the perfect calculation and i did not know this until i saw this on the tool but this real exorus was actually extremely weak on the attack as you can see the bonus is only between 286 to 381 so only three or almost four percent at a max is what i'm getting when the absolute best iv stat is actually 30 percent so this is like 10 times weaker than it was supposed to be but this will save me a lot of trouble because now i know about this and i will see it in the future to avoid using this in any future breeding because the chances to transfer these very bad iv stats are really high so i will be looking for one that has good iv stats to show you an example how to proceed when you have one that's been upgraded i have my rank 3 anubis which also has a bunch of um, pal souls being distributed to hp and attack so in this case you can simply pick them off pick your specific level which in my case is the max for the respective stats so for me i got max in hp max in attack from the upgrades plus rank three so three stars and then i'm gonna input my current amount of hp attack and defenses and again absolutely make sure that the passive skills are also introduced otherwise this will not work so once you do that, you can see that this is actually a very good specimen. So in the case of the HP, yes, it's kind of low, only 34% with the maximum possible being 50%. However, on the attack, I'm actually doing really good here. It's 27.38. Could have been better, but the difference at max level is about like 60 damage at most. So I'm not going to see that difference that much. However, the defenses don't seem to be that great. I only landed on a 4.8, which is actually really low. You can, of course, also test out to see how much you would have had of each one of these if you landed on the max IV stats. So I put 50, 30, and 30% into HP attack and defense. So the max HP could have been 7,474 instead of the 6,000 at a bit that I had. Meanwhile, attack was not that much higher despite the 3 percentage difference, so 1862 instead of 1829, so I'm gonna just take that. However, the defenses are much better, it's 741 in this case if I were to get its max possible stats instead of the one that I had, which is obviously only like... 610 now again don't overthink it too much most of these are going to fall within the middle of the pack so if you get most of the pals they will fall within that middle of the pack without many issues but um, you should still verify at least the pals that you're going to be using in breeding a lot because you have a high risk of transferring the bad iv stats and once you do that you're kind of ruining a whole batch and future generations so you will want to transfer good iv stats so that your future offsprings also have them and yeah that's pretty much it with the video now let me know down below in the comments is there any other expert tip that you might know that nobody else knows or maybe it's a more hidden one i would very much love to see how you guys play pal world in the meantime, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.